If you would, go and open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. We're continuing to take a look at uh, the Hebrew letter and some of the great concepts that are coming through this. Now, the, as the letter name implies, Hebrews, the letter was written to Christians that were Hebrew. The problem, and it seems to be the concern that was occurring, was that these Christians who used to be Hebrews have gone through some difficult times and now possibly starting to waver and start to fall back and want to go back to what they know. And so there has to be this idea that the writer is trying to come across and say, look, I need to convince you that what you're going back to isn't going to do it, isn't going to fix it, it's broke, it's incomplete. So he has the mindset of who his audience is, which is really unique because we are not Hebrew. I, I never offered anything of sacrifice. I never went to the temple. I've never, I, you know, all those things that were so a part of the Jews we don't relate to. I talked about Leviticus. I mean, who, who loves to pleasure read Leviticus? Really? Becky was talking about it. She went in and was looking at it, and she's like, ah. But they knew Leviticus instinctively. I mean, it was just something they knew. It was just something so inert within them. So, let me check a mic. I think I hear something. Okay, maybe my mic's just too loud or I'm getting too loud. There we go. So they had something that we don't have, and that's a very close association and understanding of what the Mosaic Law was about. Now, like we're looking at the letter of Romans in the afternoon, it's kind of fascinating because you have to talk a little different to somebody who has a very deep-rooted knowledge. You can't superficially just say, well, Jesus was Christ, he's the Messiah. Now, to a pagan, you could pull up some stuff, but if you started quoting a lot of scripture, <clears throat> or the Torah, to a pagan, they'd sit there and go, well, okay, that's kind of mythological and stuff. But to the Jew, who grew up memorizing the Psalms. I mean, they, it was instinctive. So you got to talk to them differently. You have to convince them. You have to be logical about it. And that's what's so beautiful about this letter is his ability to come through and start out by first off, how does God talk to you? How has God spoken in the past? Well, as a Jew, you know, through the prophets, you know, they came through. God spoke to different people in various times in various ways. So he nails it and says, but nah, it's Jesus now, right? And he works his way systematically through all of the things and the, the concepts and the things that they endeared so much and thought was so important, especially in relationship to those pagans. How perfect. I mean, if grandpa, grandpappy did it, my great-grandpappy did it, there's got to be something good about it. And so he goes and he starts with angels. And he says, this Jesus is greater. He also, within all of this, keeps elevating the man part of it. That's why you'll see him switch. He'll say, Jesus. That was a man to them. Today we say Jesus Christ like he's Mr. Christ. And Jesus is his first name. No. So that's another thing to pick up on. It's the way that he brings up the idea of the humanity of him and then elevates him to God. You have to go there. And today I see that being compromised sometimes where people will try to minimize this aspect of him either from the human or from the God concept side of it. So he brings that in and then he says greater than angels and then he goes to guess who's... Mo now, now, now the thing about this is a little quiz. What would be next? Abraham, let's just go historically. How can you be better than Abraham? And he tells him. And then guess what's next, historically? Big markers in history. Moses. Poo, now you're getting... So Moses, because he brought the law. He led him out of bondage. I mean, he is the father of their nation. And he says, and he showed them, he's greater than that. And then he really comes in this idea that you got this blessing fulfilled of this land by Joshua. Milk and honey supposed to be a place of rest. Mm, not so much. Jesus is better than that. And he uses scripture. He just doesn't 
you know, kind of like, well, you know, the concept's kind of wove in there. No, he decisively brings up. He says things like this. You know that if there wasn't a rest yet to come, then why is there one spoken of as if there was one still to come, even when Joshua had brought you into this land of rest? Now, I'm terribly paraphrasing this, but hang with me. So he says, you know, we came into this land, and that was supposed to be the land of rest. So why was there it spoken about another day? And that's what's so beautiful about this letter is he brings together and connects these dots that even we today and the Jews sitting there reading it, they're going, bam, bam, bam. He's just connecting it and it's just opening up to them. And he says, look at that. Why do you talk like that? Because there was another day. And then he moves to what's next most precious is priest. And now that's another one that we don't associate with. We don't like that idea. We, like, we push back. But the concept is so imperative for us to understand and value it. Because without a priest from the Garden of Eden onward, we could never approach God. Period. And the best that we could do right outside of the garden after we were, you know, removed, what, 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 what do we see happening? Sacrifice. One was accepted, one wasn't. Right? And from that time forward, we start to see mankind sacrificing. Why? We don't know exactly when it was written, when it was told, but we know that there was something spoken to Adam and Eve and his descendants immediately that you have to offer a sacrifice. And that was because sin had come into the world. You cannot coexist in pure holiness. It's like, like walking into a nuclear reactor. It's so brilliant and pure, you would be burnt. You couldn't do it. God cannot compromise his purity and allow us to come near him something has to happen so he had the plan from the foundations of the earth from when he put everything together john talks about that that there was this plan but it needed time to fulfill you know who needed the time god didn't we did because we can sit nearly six thousand years later and look at this magnificent plan and grasp the power, the magnificence of our God and His love and His faithfulness in spite of our lack of faithfulness is demonstrated historically through the Bible time and time and time again. But the priesthood was something significant to a Jew as he's listening it. He understood it. He saw the history of the priest. And he was living, this Jew of that century, because this was probably written, all indications are, when this was written, sacrifices were still occurring in the temple. So, hey, we switch back over to Mosaic Law. Now we've got sacrifices going on. After 70 AD, no, it's gone. So they understood how important it was, but they saw the corruption of it as well. When Jesus was walking and living among them in his ministry, what did Jesus expose was so broken? The priesthood. And if priesthoods broke, what does that do for them? It corrupts their relationship. So he's got to bring them back to the reality of what they initially accepted is still the right thing. It's the better thing of them all. So when he talks about Jesus now coming in as a priest, you got a problem. You got a serious problem. Because remember, they knew according to the law that it had to come through the Levitical descendants. If you're going to be a high priest, you had to be not only in the Levitical tribe or the tribe of Levi, but you had to be a descendant of Aaron. And, and within Aaron, you couldn't just be any boy. You had to be the firstborn. Very specific, right? Because he's the only one that could actually get close as you could get to God. And the way did he do it? Well, once a year, he would offer that sacrifice of atonement. But he had to do it twice, didn't he? Because it's imperfect. Why is it imperfect? What's broke here? Well, the first time reminded the high priest of what the problem was. You are a man and you're a sinner. The humility should have come about that when that high priest sacrificed that animal, the innocent animal, and took that blood. And he walks into the Holy of Holies, walks up to that mercy seat between the cherubims, takes blood, 
for his sins and puts it on the chair. Then he comes out and he gets blood from a sacrifice and comes in and offers it for everyone else. Now that just appease God. That just, that just kind of, I, I describe it as paying the interest on a debt. How frustrating is that when you get your bill and you see that you've just been paying interest, you've never touched the debt? Boy, that's common today, isn't it? Look at your house payment. And you look at any payment. If you look at your finances, you'll notice that the first couple of years, you are never touching the principal, are you? All you're doing is what? Keeping them from coming and getting your property. You're keeping your credit good, and you're paying the interest off. You're not doing the debt. The principal's still there. That's what sin was. So all you could do, now, now God said that's acceptable because he had a further plan, and he knew it was going to happen because he's God. And he accepted that process, but you see it's how it's broke. You could never get rid of the principal debt. You could only maintain that. And it was a teaching moment. All those things were teaching. So now when we come into this idea of Jesus being a king, they got that. They understood that. And that's what, when we look at this, one of the first things we find that I think is so important for us to help to tie all this together for us, 2,000 years later, non-Jewish, and the idea of how important it was that the law had to be fulfilled, not destroyed, it wasn't rejected, was this idea in Psalms 110. Psalms 110. It's one of those psalms that I know every time before Christ came that when a Jew read that, he struggled with it. You know why? Because it proclaimed two things about this Messiah. One of them, they could accept. It said, you're going to be a king. So here's a little bit of it, Psalms 1, 1 through 4, 110, 1 through 4, but listen to it. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. What does that sound like? King, scepter, power. We like that. As a Jew, we want that, right? Go on now. He says, your mighty scepter saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Yeah, we want that too, man. As a Jew, you're like, yes. And especially when the Romans were occupying their land. This is a beautiful thing. We want that. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has swollen and sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Oops. Okay, you had me tell Melchizedek. Now, historically, they knew who he was. Yeah. He, he ran across in Genesis uh, 14, verse 17, this, this historical moment that they had all grown up learning about, kind of like we did in the Southwest, Billy the Kid and all that stuff. Eh, you know, kind of something. Because there's so very little said, and we covered that more in depth, but that encounter established a precedent, you see. It's a little one of those markers that God dropped into the Scripture to help confirm what he was going to do. Because if you read it historically, you know, Abraham goes, Lot gets captured, he's off, and I'm really going fast, you know, and so Abraham goes, he recaptures Lot, and he goes back home, there's the encounter and all this, and it, but whoa, there's like this speed break right in the middle of it, boom! And you have this one little moment. These few little verses in the middle of all that amazing battle and all that chaos going on. And what does he say? And on his return, Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High God, not the pagan God, Most High God, came out to Abraham. And he ministered as a priest to Abraham. Now, if you didn't understand the priesthood, you'd think he just came out and he was showing hospitality, that he brought bread and wine. He was ministering to Abraham as a priest. Now, historically, it's a speed bump and the Jew listening to this. And uh, years later, when he read this psalm, he's going, OK, yeah, 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 Melchizedek. That's kind of cool. Kind of came out, gave him some hospitality. That was the way they did things. Slow down. 
And then what do we learn? He talked about how the idea that we don't know who his father was, we don't know who his mother was. It's as if he just appeared. Now, just as. He wasn't Christ incarnate. I do not believe that. Because the way it's phrased is his priesthood was in the order of the Son of God. Not the other way around. See, you kind of missed that part. Stay with me because that's important when we come into Hebrews here. So it's a pre-existing priesthood. 400 plus years later, you have a priesthood of Aaron and Levi under Mosaic law. Now fix that. How do, where do you put this Melchizedek in the righteous scale? Where do you place him? Because to the Jew, if it was Mosaic law and it was there, that's solid, man. But if you're outside of the Mosaic law, eh, you pagans, you got a rough time. I don't know how you're found right with God. So how do you figure that out? Go back to Genesis and try to figure out how is he declared as being a priest to the God most high. Now, I can't figure it out. Let's move on. You've had passages like that, right? Where you've read it and you went, well, can't quite figure that one out, but we'll get with it later. That's what they did. Well, guess what the Hebrew writer's doing? Hey, here it is. This is what it's all about. That was not insignificant. And now he then says, you know, it's, it's, it's a confusing way he says it. When he says, the Lord says to my Lord. So now who's writing this? David. Now how in the world is David? Now this is, and this is why we now can take this kind of confusing structure and bring it to the New Testament because Jesus does that, doesn't he? In Matthew 22, 41, when the Pharisees were, well, whatever they're doing and stuff, you know, Jesus gets them. Because this is the one psalm, again, they love the king side, don't get the priest side. Now, this isn't where Jesus exposes the idea or reveals the idea that he's going to be this Messiah's priest and king. But the fact that he anchors this to the Messiah means by default, the second concept of Psalms 110 is right there with it. But he throws them for a loop to indicate there's something different. And they can't answer it. Look what he says. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, Son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, and I will put your enemies under your feet. <coughs> if then David calls him Lord, how is he son, his son? See, they, he, what did he ask him? Who do you say the Messiah is? Well, he's the son of David. Okay. And so Jesus says, then how does he call him Lord? And they couldn't answer him, huh? No one was able to answer him, and they don't ask him another question. See, that's a hard heart. A humble heart would say, help me out with this. You're right. How does he do that? But you see, and these were a part of the religious institution that was supposed to be representing God's law. And you see how hard they were to understand this? And the reason I bring this in is because Jesus is anchoring this as an important point that when he ascends and starts to reign, writers like the Hebrew writer can tie it all together. And now if you're a Hebrew that's wavering in your faith towards this Jesus that you said was the Christ, and now you're kind of wavering, he can bring back and connect these to build you back up, pull you back to your faith. But it still doesn't really, there's still some things that are like, okay, how are you the priest? Now I'm going to skip through some of this because we did a lot of that last week in 11 to 13, in Hebrews 7, 11 to 13. He brings out the idea that there's a problem with the priesthood. Like I talked about, it could pay the principal, but it, it could pay the interest, but it could not pay the debt, right? There was more than that. It just not only was failing in the blood sacrifice, but the whole process was flawed. And that's why he says, now if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, you notice he inserts in here, for under 
under it the people receive the law. He associates this imperfect priesthood to the law that he's already been building logically, saying it's not perfect either. He said, so what further need would there have been for another priest to arise in the order of Melchizedek? See, he's already brought up Psalm 110. And now they're sitting there going, okay, he's king and he's priest. So why do we need another priest? If I was a Jew, I'd go, Aaron, that's a good solid one. So why was it mentioned that this Messiah was going to be a king and a priest? And he said, so there's a problem here, right? So why do we bring it up in the order of Melchizedek and not Aaron? Just make, us, make, make Jesus, why couldn't he have just said, okay, I'm God, I'm sovereign, boom, I'm going to keep him in the order of Aaron. He can't do that because, you see, the law was specific. God is not going to change the law. He said it was Levitical. It's not going to change. He's not going to all of a sudden do some magic, and I say that kind of blasphemous, but he wasn't going to do some magic and all of a sudden go, well, you know, technically he is a Levite. He wanted to demonstrate it's not perfect. Look at the Levites. I'm bringing you something superior, Melchizedek. And why? Because he even superseded all of you. And through that tribute that Abraham gave to Melchizedek, you Levites who normally never tithe, the Levites, the priests did not tithe. Who would they tithe to? Nobody. Everybody tithes to the priest. And he says in a kind of a strange way, he goes, you know, even when you were still a speckle in your daddy Abraham's eye, you actually paid tithes to this Melchizedek. So why do you want something that's flawed? Why do you want something that's inferior than what you have? So when you change the priesthood, though, it's a link to where now he says the law has to change. It doesn't, it may, you can't amend it like our Constitution, like we do our laws. We'll amend things, not with God, because there was nothing perfect. Because when something's perfect, why would you take something perfect and amend it to something that's broke? Right? Why would you take the gospel that's so beautiful and perfect and amend it to something that's broke? And that's what he's kind of bringing out. So the idea of him serving as a priest and a king, he moves now to looking at this idea of the covenant. Now, a guarantor, when we look at this, and there's a couple of surety, the New King James and the new, I think the, the American Standard, a surety, it, it, it's kind of lost a little bit in that. It's kind of like the person who can co, um, co-sign for a loan. Now, I know when I was young, you know, I, you know, somebody would say, I'd go and ask them, hey, would you co-sign a loan? They won't give it to me. I'm, I'm apparently not worthy enough. I'm only 19. I've only had a job six days. And, I, you know, I'm, so I'd go to my dad. And they'd look at my dad and they'd go, hmm, well, Mr. Herring, you, you, you know, you're this old. And you, yeah, you've got good, okay, you know what? We'll let you put your name on his loan. And Ron can have that, whatever he's trying to get. And if you look at salvation, it's kind of the same kind of a concept in that, you know, there's no way that anybody can guarantee your salvation. The Mosaic Law was, a fa- was failed. It, I mean, it was, it was fragile. It was, it was faulty and all this. You don't want Aaron's priesthood to co-sign for your salvation. You saw them fail. Their credit score, their spiritual credit score was up and down, up and down, wasn't it, through their history? Look at the period of Judges. Their credit score was spirit. I just keep saying that, right? Isn't it appropriate? Don't you want something better? Because again, your salvation was dependent upon their spiritual credit score. Because your sacrifices had to go through them. Don't you want something that's perfect? Every time? Never wavering? I do. And that's what he's trying to show them. And so now in 22 through 25... This he makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds the priesthood permanently. 
because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now let's parse this out. When we look at this, it's amazing. Like I said, I think we understand the idea that if you've got somebody that you need to guarantee in a relationship with God, you want him. You want his type of a priesthood to be the one before God, not those fragile ones. You know, and the idea of this new covenant is not a new concept. Over in Luke, during, we see it recorded during the Lord's Supper. What did Jesus say that night? We see in Luke twenty two twenty, And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. That fits the prophecy. Jeremiah, which is another one that I think they kind of struggled with because of the way it's worded. We won't cover all that prophecy there, but look at what he says. Jeremiah 31, 31, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. What? And so, you know, if you're looking at that, listening to Jeremiah, you might be thinking, is he going to stack a covenant on a covenant? What's he going to do here? Because the covenant that Moses gave is pretty good. I mean, that's pretty awesome. That established all that we are. No, he said new. So these are the passages that if you were Jewish and you're listening to this writer of the Hebrew letter would go, wow. So now what do we have? What do we, what do we connect to the dots? He is eternal, Jesus, greater than everything you've seen. He is a great, perfect priest from Melchizedek. Scripture cite, cited. The idea that a new covenant that was better cited. Jeremiah 31, 31. All these things. You cannot get around it logically as a Jew listening to this. Unless you're just so hard. But these are Christian Jews who are struggling. You and I, we, we dissociate with it. But I'll tell you what, this is one of the most encouraging letters that helped my non-Jewish mind draw close to God. And it's not just stopping there, but there's more to come that is so wonderful as he looks at this. And so, he clearly has talked about a new priesthood and a new covenant. And he's tied it to those readers of this letter. So now he says, the former priest, what's the problem with it? They died. They were sinful. They were corrupt. You have some good ones, bad ones, but it, it just wasn't. And so, what's the better one? Well, just like Melchizedek, that seemed to mysteriously be eternal, we don't know his father, his mother, and to a Jew, that's pretty mysterious, right? Because they knew, they knew everybody from their father, whoop, all the way back to Abraham. All the way back to Abraham. If you're a Jew and you didn't know that, there's something wrong with you. They knew it, and they knew the importance of it, and they spoke that way. I mean, when they talked to one another, it was like, what tribe are you from? And then within that tribe, they could sit and track it down. One of the biggest challenges they had is coming out of Babylon when the tribe of Judah came back, and Ezra is trying to straighten all that out, right? And one of the most important things he had to do was figure out who was from the tribe of Levi. And they were sorting through that to make sure that you could prove that you are a Levite before they'd let you serve. It was that ingrained in them. Genealogy was everything. But then you have Melchizedek. Whew, just seems to come out of nowhere. And he continues. And that's the tense in the Hebrew, and the tense in the Greek is the continuousness of Melchizedek, not the temporariness that they have been living under like that. And so that also, permanent priesthood never changes. And... He's not going to die. He's always going to be right there. And remember the idea, remember I told you, the high priest would come into the Holy of Holies, go out and come back in, and, that, and next year, next year, he'd repeat. But he couldn't stay in there. He couldn't stay in there. So now you have a high priest who is before the throne, the mercy seat, the ark, Jesus, and he's ministering. And guess what blood he's got there on that mercy seat? 
his. He doesn't have to go anywhere to go get more blood because it's been offered once and for all. You see how beautiful that is? And he's the only one that can do it. He doesn't have to go away and come back, go away and come back. And that's what I think is so wonderful about this. When he says, consequently, he says, he is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercessions for them. That high priest couldn't do that. He could not always offer those intercessions for you. So many things that were contingent on how he could offer them for you. Not Jesus. That word uttermost, it's kind of deceptive, a little bit. You can skip over and go, a lot, to the biggest. There, there, I heard one, his name was Billy Sunday. He was an old gospel preacher. I don't know what denomination necessarily, but I read the quote. But he, before he had started preaching, he was a drunk. And he would call it, when he'd come to this section, the gutter most, because he was a drunk in the gutter. And he saw it that God, Jesus, could save to the guttermost. Even in the gutter, he could save you. I don't think that's really a great, accurate description of that. I think another one is there is no one he can't save to the end. Now, could the priest ever give you a sacrifice that could keep you right with God? not to the uttermost. Because if it was an imperfect sacrifice, if the priest was in sin himself, it would stop. It couldn't. And so there was this idea there that there, it's not continually perfect, but not with Christ. In other words, from the beginning of your drawing to God, through Him, you have confidence you're saved. Under Jewish law, no. And so that's what is so amazing. No matter, and I do believe that it does demonstrate. It doesn't matter if you're in the gutter. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. He can save to the utmost completeness of it. And that is something that is very dear for us as well. 26 through 28, let's read through there. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, <clears throat> separated from sinners and exalted to the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his first own sins and then for the, those of the people, since he did this once and for all and he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weaknesses as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Lot packed into this too. So it was fitting. And the way he describes this is like the opposite of what you could see in the priests, and especially during the first century when Jesus was there. You know, the, you didn't find priests that were holy. You found corruption. You had two high priests, supposedly. You know, you'll read about when Jesus was being tried, right? Ananias and Cephas. What's that about? Where did the law change and say, hey, it's okay, man, you can have two high priests. You know, as a matter of fact, there were more in 100 years changes of high priests than ever before that period of time, about 100 years before Jesus came. I can't remember the total number, but there was like 100, 100 changes in the high priest because of corruption and different things like that. And some of them were not even the firstborn as specified. They'd say, yeah, try a urinary descendant. It, it was a mess. And so you see that here, holy. Yes, Jesus is holy. Innocent. Yes, he was innocent. Unstained. Same thing. Perfect. And what is he also? He's not a part of sinners. Not trying to say somehow it's self-righteous. But the priests were a part of the sinner group, right? But not Jesus. Not Jesus. And guess where he's at? He's not in the tent behind the Holy of Holies. He's in heaven where God really lives. That's what you want. And 
The other part of showing that perfection, I think the Hebrew writer is building off of what he just, the descriptors he gave of him, the way that he comes in here now and says, he has no need like those other high priests who had to continually keep doing it. And they not only, like I've already pointed out a couple of times, they had to do it twice, right? Not Jesus. So if you're a Hebrew and you're reading this letter as it had just arrived at your congregation, you, you got to be going, this is rhetorical. I mean, why in the world would I? No, I wouldn't want to go back. We as Christians should appreciate how wonderful we have this high priest for us who is continually before God interceding for us. And not just anything, but a beautiful covenant that he has blessed us with. And so he has done it. He has completed it once and for all. This kind of is a, a little bit of a thread over to 1 John chapter 1 when he talks about the relationship that we have with one another and how we maintain that. Is one, it came first by those who received it and then you and I have heard it throughout the years and that builds us this fellowship relationship in Christ. But then he says, you know, you have an issue and that has to do with sin. And if you think you don't sin, well, you're a liar. And you're making, well, you're making God a liar because he calls us sinners. But he says what? We have access to the blood. If we are humble and we will turn to Jesus and, and confess our sins to him, you see this almost the same type of a vision of where Jesus is there in the throne room with his blood, in a sense, figuratively. He doesn't got to, oh, there's Ron again. Hey, I got to go. I'll be back, Father. I got to go get a sacrifice. No, he's got the blood there. And it's figuratively. It's not real blood, but it's, the point is it was perfect blood. And so it's always there, as John says, that as we go there, we are forgiven again because that blood is still atoning us once we stop asking for forgiveness and humbling ourselves. We will lose access to the blood and to the moderator or the mediator, Jesus, as our high priest. So it's, it's all throughout the importance of our relationship with him. And then he points out the flaw of the law. There's a weakness. You can see that. <clears throat> he brings that up again. Now this is important because now he's taking once again the, the, the well, and it was prophetic, in the Psalms or the Old Testament or the Torah, as they would call it, and bringing it in and showing logically the importance of this. How did you become a priest? Well, I just kind of revealed that. You had to be born of a Levi, and, that, and you just got it. You know, if I, if I just happen to be the, the firstborn of Aaron's son, and my daddy died, guess what? Bingo! I'm the man. Why? Because it was genealogically. It was just a part of the, the law. It just kind of came along. And, and regardless of my son, my firstborn, if I was Aaron's son, my son, regardless of who he was, how good he was, anything about him, he automatically became the next high priest. See a problem with that? Can you guarantee that every firstborn of Aaron is going to be a decent man? And what right does he have to have that honor? What did he ever do other than the fact that he is a descendant of Aaron? That's not special. So it's legislative. It's just genealogy. Nothing special about it. And that brings up the fault. But Psalms 110, he swore, I will not relent. You will be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. There has never been a priest that God specifically looked at and said, you are going to be the priest. The only one was Jesus, the Messiah. And that's what he's showing them. <laughs> this isn't a haphazard, just genealogical accident that a guy shows up and he, he's a descendant of Aaron and the firstborn and now he's a priest. No, God saw that the same Messiah that was going to be your king, your deliverer, the king of peace, he was going to be your priest by an oath. And God takes all his oaths seriously because he knows it's perfect. That's the other part of that. 
we got a lot more to do <laughs> go into this and so I hope you'll continue because we it, it sounds like that's all I've been talking about but that's so important about this concept that we push back a little but I want us to pull close I want you to see the beauty of this and our day right now that we have this magnificent high priest that we have been blessed with if we were a Jew under the old law and we came out they would be so excited when they put all this together because they would know the difference between the priesthood of Aaron and now the priesthood of Jesus the Messiah and that we just take for granted I'm afraid you know we just kind of well you know I'll pray I'll get forgiveness did you realize all that's going on there that God did for us well I want to stop by asking you is he really your high priest is he serving you if you haven't accepted the gospel and become a Christian like he said what did he say even within this he says those who come to the father through him so you can't even get to the father unless you come to Jesus that's another problem I have with when people minimize who Jesus was as God and as man you minimize him you minimize my connection to God period because that's what the Bible teaches in the New Testament I have nothing with the Father without Him. But is He your Savior? Have you accepted the conditions in which He taught His disciples to then go out and take that word as He commanded them? What did He tell them? Mark 16, 16. We could probably, oh, I hopefully say it. You know, go, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to do what? To repent and be baptized. What did they do when they stood up on the day of Pentecost? Did they stay up and say, did they stand up and say, just this Messiah, let him be your personal Savior? Did, did, did Peter stand up and then say, when the men said, what do we got to do? Say, well, let's just have a prayer. What did he say? That's what's important. Not what people are inferring, he said. What did he say? They said, what do we do? And he said, repent, stop living the way you were, and be baptized in order to what? Get their sins forgiven. Not to join a church. Get your sins forgiven. Now, I understand. Yes, it, you know, like Peter said, it's not the washing away of anything. There's nothing necessarily that's like miraculous about that. But you know what it is? It's an amazing proclamation of your faith in Him. Jesus said, you want your sins forgiven? What I want you to do is be immersed. Why would you not want to do that? Paul said in Romans chapter 6, how do we get into Christ? Do you not know as many of us were baptized? We're baptized into Christ. We're buried into His death. We are raised in the newness of His resurrection. Where do you get it? Having a personal Savior? Just having a prayer? No. I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of beating this to death, but it, I get so frustrated. When people have a false belief that they're saved, and they're not. Why do we beat around about that? Why do we try to soft cushion it? God didn't. His prophets didn't. It's not confusing. It's that important. And baptism is not a work. It's not. It's something that you do to demonstrate to him. But it's so important because he said it's contingent. You want forgiveness? And after that, guess what? You have this amazing high priest that every time you fall short, you don't have to go get baptized again. Guess what? Just like I talked about in 1 John chapter 1, he says now you turn to that high priest and you confess your sins to him in heaven. And guess what? He's got the perfect blood right there. Now, that keeps us in a right relationship. Not a perfect one because we fall. But it keeps us righteous before God. Not perfect. When we lose that right condition is when we stop desiring to fix our sins. But every time you stumble, get up. Get up. Go to the Son. Ask for the forgiveness. And that blood is there. 
So either condition you have this morning, whether you need to initially accept the gospel and let him become your priest and serve you, or maybe you have stepped away. Go back to him. It's a personal salvation. It's not a group salvation. You have to do it. We would love to pray with you if you need that, if we can help you. I cannot pray you into heaven. I can't pray and give you forgiveness. I can only be there as your brother and pray with you. That's how personal it is. But you're going to have to make that decision this morning. So I urge you, think about eternity. Because that's where we're all going to be. Somewhere else, we know that. Go to a graveyard. Remind yourself. Remind yourself. If you're 19, you may not think that's true. But I'm 60 and I believe it (laughs) more and more. I don't know how many breaths I've got left, but I guarantee you, I don't want it wasted here and lose heaven. And I don't want you to either. So think about these things. If we can help you and you're comfortable, come forward. If not comfortable now, get a hold of somebody that if they can help you, build you up or establish that relationship. Think about these things while we stand and sing.